So at this point, we know that the wave function can be expressed as this summation over here. And in particular, in the last few videos, we've been focusing on the infinite square well, where we found that this function xi n is equal to this sine function over here. So n pi divided by ax. So this is the most general solution to the Schrodinger equation. And these cn's are unspecified. They can be uh, whatever they want to be. So in order to lock down the values of these constants, we have this formula over here. So we can lock down the values of cn by specifying an initial wave function. So after you specify an initial wave function, you take this integral, and then you can lock down the values of cn. And you can just plug it back into this expression here to obtain your uh, final solution. So there's a special way by which we can interpret this constant cn over here, in that the modulus of cn squared is going to be equal to the probability that if you take a measurement of energy, this is going to return to you the nth energy level. So this is the interpretation. And I'm going to show you two results that sort of confirm this interpretation. So if this interpretation is indeed sound, then you can expect that this summation over here to be equal to 1. And the reason for this is because here you're just essentially uh, adding up all the, possi all the possibilities. So if you add up all the probabilities, it has to be equal to 1. That's just how probability works. So if we can prove this, this is going to be a further confirmation of this interpretation over here. So let's try to prove this. So in order to prove this, we're going to focus on the initial wave function. So we know that the initial wave function has to be normalized. That's just the definition of a wave function. It has to be normalized. So this relationship is indeed true. So we're going to tamper with the right-hand side over here. So we can change this wave function and then express it as a linear combination of our xi n's. So this is going to be a conjugate times the initial wave function. So here I'm going to use m as the dummy variable dx. So as you can see here, uh, this argument, as you can see I'm constructing a rather general argument. This is going to apply for xi's that are complete and mutually orthogonal. So of course you can see that because for the infinite square well these functions are indeed mutually orthogonal and complete. So this argument applies for the infinite square well, but note that this is actually I'm constructing a general argument. So you see that I didn't put bounds for the integral. The bounds are going to be whatever the situation, uh, whatever the setup uh, allows it to be. So in the case of the infinite square well, it's going to be from 0 to a, but it could be anything else for a different setup. So this is going to be a general argument. So now our next step is going to be to try to expand these brackets over here. And before I do that, I can actually put the conjugates on the inside. So after I put the conjugate on the inside, I'm going to have to try to expand these brackets. So essentially, this left-hand bracket over here, this is just the conjugate of C1 times the conjugate of Xi1 plus the conjugate of Z2 Xi times the conjugate of Xi2 and so on. So you see 3 Xi3. So here you have C1 times Xi1 plus C2 Xi2 and then C3 Xi3 and C4 Xi4 and so on. And you can see as you expand these brackets you're going to get terms that go like uh, so let's just say for example we multiply these two terms together. So we have C1 conjugate we have C2 times Z, Xi1 conjugate times Xi2. And then if we integrate this, this is of course going to be equal to zero because of this, these terms over here. These two functions are mutually orthogonal, so it's going to have to be equal to zero. And then you, see, you can see that a similar argument can be applied to many of the terms. So you're going to have xi1 multiplied by xi3, xi1 multiplied by xi4, and then in the end you're always going to get two of these xi functions that are mutually orthogonal. And then if you integrate them, they're going to go down to zero. So you can see that immediately after you expand these brackets, a lot of the terms are going to go down to zero because of this mutual you know, orthogonal property. And you see that the only expressions that survive are the ones uh, where you have xi1 multiplied to xi1, xi2 multiplied to xi2, xi3 multiplied to xi3, and so on. And you can see that these terms survive because the, the, ortho, the orthogonal property does not step in because xi1 multiplied by xi1 uh, it's, they are not ortho orthogonal. The mutual orthogonal only applies when the subscripts are different. So you see that in the end, the only terms that survive are c1 squared, xi1 squared, plus c2 squared, xi2 squared, 
plus c3 squared and xi is 3 squared and so on. So you get the idea, dx. And then of course we can just rewrite this as the sum of n equal to 1 infinity cn squared xi n squared. So I'm just going to pull everything out of the bracket, uh, out of the integral. So I have this integral of xi n squared. And then this, by definition, is going to be equal to 1, because these functions are normalized. So in the end, you have n equal to 1 uh, all the way to infinity of cn. So you have this summation over here. As we've seen earlier, uh, on the left-hand side, this we know that this is equal to 1. So in the end, we found that this summation is indeed equal to 1. So we have proven this statement. So we have found confirmation of our interpretation of cn. So this is the first result that I'm going to prove.